music. <laughs> Winchester Model 40. We promised you. All right, let's talk about the Model 40 here. Winchester's second attempt at a self-loading shotgun. Another failure, but for uh, different reasons. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, there's a lot of misinformation about this gun in a lot of different books, even my books that I really, um, I really believe the information is accurate on a lot of other stuff i know that they're wrong these just things that they're saying are wrong about this shotgun and that i just i just know are wrong so um it's really tough to get information on this guy there's like one other video up on youtube that shows one of these it's some guy from like 10 years ago or something that says like yeah i got one of these uh somebody gave it to me it's all rusty i'm gonna fix it up and that's it you never heard from the guy again um there's no information on this thing. It was released in 1940 and discontinued in 1940. Winchester basically turned their backs on it. Uh, they talk about design flaws. Nobody really knows why. I've read threads that uh, when you try to fire it using the magazine, like by pulling rounds out of the magazine, a couple of uh, instances of uh, rounds going off with the bolt not closed, like out of battery and destroying the bolt. I've read two different stories about that. Um, I did shoot trap with it. I'm going to explain uh, exactly how it went. It's obviously all in one piece, so everything went okay with the round of trap that I shot. Um, what else? It's uh, it's uh, like Winchester Obscura. That's what it is. So let's take a look. It's uh, This one is 30-inch barrel, full choke. Um, it's nice. No destruction going on here. No massive abuse. But this is just a plain Jane one. No checkering. Look at that front sight is interesting, right? And it's like, it looks like it's actually part of the forging of the barrel. I don't think that's an add-on. I think that's just when the barrel was made, it's just like kind of cut into the forging. So see, there's no checkering here. This plain Jane one. But uh, a nice example, 30-inch barrel, full choke. Let's take a look at production numbers, how they offered it. Let me get, uh, get my Winchester book out. Here's the Winchester. I'm going to use the handbook for now. Okay, but these are the maddest books. Um, Matt, the maddest books. Uh, they're good. Um, like There is some info in here, but like I said, um, there is a little... Uh, there is some inf uh, misinformation on this guy. All right, I messed up. Where Where is it? I took out my bookmark. All right, here's my information on the Model 40. Right away, they're wrong. Using the same basic buffer and friction system as the Model 11, which we just did, and we'll take a, we'll take a look. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll poke around over there a little bit just for some comparisons. Um, with the ba same basic buffer and friction system as the Model 11 to accomplish autoloading, the Model 40 had the same defects as the Model 11 and saw little production. That is not true. Uh, little production, yes, but the same defects, no. In addition to the mechanical problems, World War II stopped production of this model was to see a very limited lifespan. 28-inch and 30-inch barrels were standard, no ribs. Fuller modified chokes were offered. Improved cylinder chokes were made in very limited numbers, okay? Um, so here's one. There were these other ones made with cuts, compensators. You can see there were skeet models that had checkering here. If you're interested, there's just so few of them. It's not like you'd go shopping. Um, but it is a uh, long recoil. Uh, that's what it does share with the 11. And the A5, of course, they, they were able to uh, step up their game a little bit with the long recoil. Some standard guns were provided with cuts compensators. A special skeet gun had compensators as standard. 
Skeet guns were provided with two choke tubes and a wrench. Shotguns, which have factory-installed compensators, have a shoulder forward on the barrel to attach the compensator. Four shells in the mag, one in the tube. Uh, one unusual feature, I'm going to show you the safety. I'm going to, I, you know what, I'll show you that right now since we just crossed it. I'm going to forget. I know I'm going to forget, and it's one of the most awesome features of any shotgun. It's so weird that this would be on one of the rarest shotguns ever. But here's the safety button, right? Let's just get a little closer here. Here's the safety button. You click it back and forth like a regular safety, right? But you see it has the slot in it, right? You can turn it. You can turn. I want to try to get it where you can see what's going on. You can turn it and lock it off so that if you go in the shoot trap, you, you knock that off like that or whatever, and you never have to worry about calling for a bird, and you actually have that button. You accidentally have that button pressed. Or hunting, and you don't want to... Uh, do that, you know, if you want to just have your gun, well, this would never pass muster today, right? You can never turn your safety off these days, but man, I wish every shotgun I had that had a button safety like this had this feature because um, I have uh, pulled the trigger on, uh, you know, with the safety on and just had everybody kind of look over like, you're right, dude. So, where were we? Uh, plain, a few guns in standard or skeet models have a standard safety and don't have this feature. Did not know that. I just read that now for the first time, um, that that might not be on yours if you have one. Uh, plain unchecked walnut was used for all standard guns. Select semi-grade, semi-fancy grade walnut was used for skeet guns. Skeet guns were checked, were checked and, and pistol grips were capped. Standard guns have uncapped pistol grips. Composition butt plates were standard with all special recoil pads available. Deluxe wood was an extra, which was ordered only on 37 guns. If you have deluxe wood, hold on to that one. Straight grips were available for those who desired this feature. Didn't know that either. You can, I never saw one like that, but you could get ones with straight grips. Uh, after serial number 1172. See, that's why I love these, this Winchester book, these Mattis books, is they have such accurate information like that, but then on the other end, how do you say that it's the same buffer system as, it's not, it's not, we're going to get to that. Um, after 1172, an elm insert was placed at the rear of the forend to reduce cracking due to recoil, which, uh, you know, the 1911 was definitely prone to uh, having. And uh, here's the production numbers. As you could see, 1940 was when they, yeah, that was it. That's when they basically made all 39. They started, they cranked out like 25, 26, 71. But 10,592 made in 1940. That's when they discontinued it. They say they discontinued it in 41. I don't think so. I think they discontinued it in 40. Same year. 41 and 42 were just cleanup years, war years, where they were... So much was going towards the war effort, they would use every last piece to uh, produce for the uh, civilian market. Um, as you can see, they're mentioning that right here. So that's the uh, Winchester Handbook. Uh, where do we go from here? Let's, uh, let's take a look at the 1911. Let's pull it out again. So the 1911, okay... We had to use these buffer system. I'll throw some pictures up here. Here's the cracking we're talking about. There's all the cracking. Four ends all cracked. The uh, laminate wood all separated. Um, the bolts, the barrels and the bolts beat the crap out of these receivers. This buffer system was basically just, it didn't do anything to slow anything down. It just kind of tried to just mitigate the recoil. And uh, these things were brutish. Uh, they just could not touch Browning's patents regarding um, what he was using to uh, slow things down. Friction rings. Let's take a look. Let's get everything out of the way. And let's take a look. Now we could delve in because the 1911, it didn't make any sense to look. Let's take a look at what Browning had going on inside of here. In a nutshell, 
how this friction system worked. So the barrel, it's long recoil. So when you fire, the barrel is reciprocating like this. So this is what this spring is for. And then the bolt, it has its own spring in here that runs down this way. So if you just forget, take the bolt out of the mix for now and just concentrate just on this recoil right here. How do we mitigate this? Because it's not always going to be the same. There's going to be some shells that are powerful, some, so, you know, like whether you're pushing shot steel, whatever you're pushing out of the barrel, whatever different types of shells you're using, they're not even that uniform now. You could imagine years ago, turn of the century, uh, just going from black powder to smokeless powder. Um, it was all new to them. Um, the shells were a mess. It was Everything was all different. So to come up with a system where if it got pushed really hard, it would slow it down really fast. And if it didn't get pushed that hard, it wouldn't slow it down quite so much. You know, like, how do you do that? Browning's idea, just in a nutshell, I mean, you could probably write a book just on that study. But let's zoom in a little bit here. It was these friction rings that did it. Now, these friction rings, this is a brass ring surrounded by steel. The brass is there so that that's what wears because it's softer than the steel this is a wear part this is squeezing on this tube as a brake just like this would be the brake pads so this is what would wear out are the pads they try to save the rotors they try to save the calipers they try to save everything else so this would be like your caliper the steel ring and then this would be like your brake rotor although and it's very similar and the brass would be like your brake pad that would be like the replaceable part but as, as long as these things run, you, you, could, you could put a lifetime into these. You don't have to replace those brass rings. I mean, you'd really have to shoot a lot. But that is the wear part. Now, what happens here is, so here's the spring. There's this ring here. This ring, I don't know if you could see it in there, but it has a taper to it. Yeah, you could see that. So it has a taper. So when, if you're trying to force this brass ring into this cone here, if you force it, I don't know if you can see that, but what happens is you're 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 closing it because it's it's a, there's a gap here. It doesn't fit totally around the tube, and inside here is the same thing. You can see where the wear is here along the edge of this tapered air, this beveled part. So the same thing when that beveled part goes up against here, and it's squeezing it, it's squeezing it against this beveled ring. As that gets squeezed, the harder this gets squeezed, the tighter this closes. That's how it works where the harder and the faster it gets pushed back, the more braking action you have here. Then there's also different things. I'm going to show you. See, like inside of here, um, they show you different ways to set it up. For heavy loads or light loads so this is set up now for heavy loads it's being squeezed from both sides this ring and the ring on the barrel if it's lighter loads doesn't have to be squeezed so much you can take this off remove this you turn it around and put it all the way at the base right here with the flat side facing the spring and the taper up against the receiver here to basically nullify the taper part of it. The spring goes right up against the flat part and all you have is just now this one ring going up against the spring and you only have this taper pushing it close so it's gonna squeeze it less. And it works, it works. Uh, mine cycles just, for, just like this with the heavy loads it's perfect. It never doesn't eject. Um, but if you use like really light trap loads or whatever, you would probably have a problem. But this would be good for for anything. Even high brass would follow through here. Then they have they have magnum versions that have even more rings in here, and, you know, and, a, and a tougher spring. So there's there's lots of options. Um, knocking around. It's not just one static thing. And uh, yeah, you might have to go in here and adjust it if you're changing the loads that you want to use. But it is incredibly functional.
Now, um, Browning even used that later on with his uh, Model 8. These are very popular in the United States. Um, same thing with him going to FN to produce the A5. He also went to FN to produce this. I think it was called the, uh, hmm, I don't want to, I think it was the Model 1900 or something in, uh, in Belgium. It was in Europe. This was so advanced in Europe that uh, they didn't even really sell well. People just didn't, they couldn't even grasp it, that. It, it was so far forward that it was like leaving them behind. They were just like, huh, it does what? This also is long recoil and uh, firing uh, rifle cartridges. 1908 here, this was incredibly popular. Millions of these were made. This thing is huge. So Browning riding high on this design. And just to show you, this design went all the way to, here's my, um, my Mohawk 48. So this design went all the way to uh, the 40s here. For, uh, Remington. Remington had the model uh, 11 and uh, Savage had the model 720. Was it Savage or Stevens? The Savage, I think. They had the 720. Um, anybody that wanted to pay Browning his royalties was welcome to, uh, to use it. Look, they got smart. Look at what they did here. See how they lined this with steel? See, they got smart after a while. But uh, here, this is the same thing. Here's long recoil, the uh, 48, right? And uh, here's the ring. All right, it goes in here. It's like a, it's a little bit different. You know, instead of having the steel around it, they just put it around this ring. I mean, that makes sense. You don't, you know, they simplified things. You don't need that other ring here. They had this part that threaded onto the spring. See how it has like threads in there that actually thread uh, onto the spring itself. Uh, like that. And that gets locked onto the spring, but same basic principle is that uh, let's turn this so you could see. Maybe if I push on here, we could actually see it in action. In that when, oops, sorry. In that when this closes, when this goes up against there and you push, see how it closes? See that? It shuts. It shuts this and makes it, it turns it into a break. Uh, that's what happens. I don't have a place to put this, so bear yeah, with me. I just want to see if I can just uh, get it started. Where's the cap? Whoops. <laughs> My Mohawk 48. I love, oh, I love the Mohawk 48. We're having problems with the Mohawk 48. All right. That's it. I just want to get it together so I can stand it up without it falling apart. But yeah, long recoil went well into uh, for Remington and them guys went way uh, way into the forties there. But um, uh, the, the, that one went all the way to seventy three. Believe it or not, that one might be a seventy three. Very very late production. Like maybe they stopped production for that in seventy one, but kept making. Uh, guns too so that's why that one is so clean it's very late production it was almost unfired when i bought it and um when gas operation came that was definitely the death knell for the for the a5 for the the long recoil uh action um i suppose you could say the gas operation was better i suppose you could say that but just nothing makes up for, uh, I don't know why people, I go shooting trap with that, and then they go, how do you shoot trap with that? It's like, it's like that recoil is crazy. They will talk about how the recoil is nuts. They have a certain kind of, there's a name for that kind of recoil too, I forgot, but it's like, because there's like a secondary recoil. There's like, first there's the shot, then the barrel recoils, then the barrel has to go back forward again. Then the bolt has to fall and pick up the next round. So there's like a lot going on, but like, uh, I don't know, and that, that split second of you pulling the trigger, the shot going off, and the shot going down the barrel, everything else happens afterwards. You know, I, I have shot a 25 with my A5 here before, or whatever. and this is a Japanese production. This is like mid-80s Moroku, um, and I love it. 
I've always been looking for an older one, but just can't seem to find one that matches uh, Millsurp Garage standards. But uh, I love this uh, Moroku uh, version. But now, here's why this is nonsense about uh, the Model 40. Here we go. Let's let's finally get in here. Let's take a look. Let me show you what I'm talking about. First of all, if you don't get murdered by the uh, by the 1911 here, let's just just one more thing. If you actually don't get killed by using it, because uh, you know where there's smoke, there's fire. They do say there's all kinds of problems. You got to be careful. It's killed people. It's the widowmaker, the headbuster, the, the the destroyer, the killer, whatever you want to call it. Um, you just have to know. What you're doing, you just have to know the gun. You know, know the gun's limitations, your limitations, exactly how it operates. Be smart with the operation of any firearm um, that you're using. You know, the thing about firearms is that they're all so different. And it's like, it doesn't work in your favor, the fact that they're all different. That if someone just puts a loaded gun in your hand, I've even seen cops, like on cops or whatever, on cop shows. I'm not talking about fictional cop shows. I'm talking about like real like, you know, body cam footage or whatever, when they pick up a perp's gun, they get a perp's gun in their hands and they're like, and they're like looking for how to cycle it. How do I get the, all right, I got the mag out. Is that, and they're trying to cycle it and they're not sure how to, like, there isn't one standard way that guns operate. You know, anybody could just get in any car, put it in drive, step on the gas, turn the steering wheel. You're like, you're driving like any other car, but you're not unfamiliar. Yeah, you might not know where the like the you know the air conditioner knob is to make it cooler or hot, but um, the basic operation um, follows a certain standard that anyone could just jump in and go. And you bring your car to any um, uh, valet parking, he's going to be able to just jump in and go. But you hand the gun to somebody that they're unfamiliar with that gun, and it takes a while to figure out how do I open it, how do I hold the bolt open, uh, where's the safety. Um, how do I release the magazine? Is there a magazine? <laughs> how, what type of action is this? So there's a lot going on. It takes a while to figure out. And um, that's just how guns are. So I think that's a lot of the problem with this one, with people, with, with the Widowmaker thing, is just that um, people aren't familiar with this type of operation because Winchester had to do such an about face and move in such a weird direction to get it done to, a, to a go around the patents that Browning had that it just makes it dangerous because you have to do things that you normally wouldn't do. When else do you see knurling on the barrel that you have to grab to cycle a long recoil? You know, long recoil wasn't even that popular to begin with, but then to start even making that obscure. Um, if this thing doesn't kill you and you can figure out how to use it, forgot exactly what my point was right there, but... Um, it was different, is what I'm saying. Browning's patents started expiring. They don't last forever, patents. I looked it up. I think I was seeing... They're all different. It depends on what the patent is. That's the thing. And I don't know how they classify whether it's design or you're, or you're patenting the, the, the manufacturing of it or something. I, I don't know. But it looked like it was around 20 years. So you figure by... If these patents were around 1900... You figure by, like, the 20s, um, these patents started to expire. So, um, Winchester decided to jump in here. Probably probably took a while to design this thing, uh, just like the 1911. And um, But by then, they were able to use a bolt handle. And they were able to take a look at this. What is this looking like? This isn't like... Oh, that was my point with the 1911. My point with the 1911 was the danger of it or whatever. And then like, don't trust me. Do not take it apart. If you getting one of those, if you're watching my videos or whatever, and you're like, I want to get one of those or whatever. Um, don't take it apart. Just, just trust me when I tell you. Just clean it up really nice. You could look online. Cameron Reynolds has those videos where you could like, you want to separate the barrel and magazine tube assembly from the receiver, you'll probably be okay with that. If nobody's taken it apart before, and the rest, all the buffer rings and all that crap will be held in place, don't go any further than that. If you want to take the stock off, off the receiver, this is on the 1911 I'm talking about, right? 
Um, take that off. Don't disassemble the stock any further. There's a spring in there. Don't mess with that. Just clean the trigger up. Clean the receiver up. Clean up the barrel assembly. Put it back on. Do not disassemble what's inside the tube. It's totally different. It's like a totally different animal. Now here, look at how much like the A5 we are now. We have a ring here with a taper. Look at this. We have a friction ring, metal around the brass. Okay, we have another ring, tapered, looking like this. Right, and a spring. The hell, this is a freaking A5. What are they talking about? What are all these books talking about saying it suffers from the same deficiencies? It does not. They straight up copied Browning at this point. And you know what I'm realizing here? I can tell you straight up. I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. When I took this thing trap shooting, right? It would not fully cycle. So what I mean about fully cycle... I hate to put it together so fast. Oh, we we're going to look. Where's that insert? There it is. There's the Elm insert they were talking about. And uh, I don't see a crack on this at all. Uh, they're supposed to be prone to cracking as well. Is anything even starting? Oh, oh what's that? No. Nope. No, it doesn't even look like anything starting. This would be a good time to never fire this again. <laughs> But um, I, who, that could be more nonsense that it suffers from those same problems um, because it's not battering the same way. As a matter of fact, and it's like they overcompensated because um, what was happening now is, you know what? I, I think I'd rather, uh, I'd rather demonstrate. So I'm going to put it back together. It's a little easier to put this guy back together because this... For some reason, it's a little bit different of a design. This can, this will actually lock into place. Watch. Yeah. See? It locks in there. And stays so it doesn't just fly apart when you go to put it together. And you have, like, this whole threaded area, too. Just nice and relaxed. Screw it in. So there's, like, a barrel stop on there somewhere. Now, what was happening to me was... Uh, blah, 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 blah. where are my snap caps? All right, so I would, these are snap caps, by the way. Somebody told me that I'm not, uh, they made a comment that I'm not, uh, I'm not vehemently telling everybody enough that these are snap caps and that somebody might think I'm actually throwing live rounds in there. I thought, like, just by looking at what this looks like, that that would be plainly obvious, but I guess they have a point. So, this is a snap cap, it's inert. And never load live rounds in a gun to test it out and fool around like this. You know, I guess they're right. I shouldn't make fun of them like that. They, they're they actually right. I should say that every single time. But, um, it's loaded. I mean, it's, it's loaded with a snap cap. Okay, so, what was happening to me was, the, um, I would fire the action... Everything was working great. It's way too hard for me to do this, but it would come all the way back, eject the shell, right? But it would eject the shell. Let me just uh, do it like this. So it would eject the shell. It would come back far enough to here, let's say, to eject the shell. Let's just say that's ejected, but not go back far enough to lock open. So it would just it would just come back come back closed again. So after I would fire, it would be sitting like this, even with nothing in the tube, just one at a time. I'm saying, and I would have to. And then I so then I would have to open it again, drop around in, close it, and then I would shoot. It would be ejecting, but just landing like that. So it's like it just wasn't pushing back hard enough. It was like maybe too much resistance in how the barrel slides. It doesn't feel anywhere near as smooth as the A5. Now, something that I realize now that I never tried out. It's 
take a look in here again. And like I said, there's no information on this gun. So nothing said anything about how you can manipulate these rings to do anything different except just right here. There was no authorization to move them around is what I'm saying. There's nothing in here to tell you what to do. But remember on the browning, let's take a look again. On the browning, and I could probably post up, I'll put this up here, but I might post up something that's a little clearer to read. But the bottom line is, take a look at what I'm posting here, and then let's just look at it in actuality. So with the A5, I don't even even I don't even know if I need the A5 here because it's it's basically the same. It's the same parts. The ring even has the taper the same. So with the browning, this would be for heavy loads. And I, sure enough, I was not cycling um, fully. It needed a bit more. So maybe the loads aren't heavy enough. Maybe if I was using high brass, I wouldn't be having a problem. So with the browning, what you would do is you would strip this down. You would take the tapered end, right? And you would put that flat against here. Then you would put the spring. Then you would just put this. And that does look like it butts up against there flush. And then it would be only the one side that would be breaking now. So it would slide easier. Does it feel like it slides easier? I have to first, you know what, with this one, let's, let's lock it in. Oh, it's popping out now, which is interesting. It was staying there before, but now it won't even stay in because I guess there's more spring pressure because that ring is on this side. No, that should make a difference. It's making some kind of difference. Let's get this on. Let me see if I feel a difference. This is some, some real world testing going on here. I don't know why I didn't think of that before. I'm like, if it is the same as Browning's design, why not utilize that, that advantage of being able to uh, set the rings up? This I want to shoot around the trap like this and see what happens. Maybe this is how people blew up their Model 40s, though. Since there's no information on them, maybe that's how it happened. You know what? I gotta, I gotta stand it up. I'm sorry, guys. It's going together differently. I'll tell you that. But in order to tighten this all away, I had to just stand it up on the table. So now, oh, that feels a little better. Maybe, maybe it will cycle now. I couldn't push it anywhere near that much. So it's definitely grabbing a little bit. I'm going to leave it in this configuration. And uh, I am going to give that a try and see if it will uh, fully cycle. And then I might get brave enough to put a few in the uh, tube. See if I could duplicate the uh, blowing up the gun problem. So what else? What do we got? Let's look at some uh, more literature. Let's move the gun so I can... Uh, here we go. Let's see what uh, Winchester's big book says. Mattis's big book. What do we got in here? Here it is. Again, the same basic principles as its predecessor, the Model 11. Yeah, same basic principles. Long recoil operation, but not the, not what you're talking about. Look, look, look. To control recoil, a buffer provided sufficient friction to slow down the rearward moving barrel. All right, I don't know. They're calling it a buffer. It's a friction ring, but it does slow down the rearward moving of the barrel, which, what did they write for the 1911? Did they write that the 1911 buffer? I'd love to find that. I wonder how long that would take. <laughs> I don't know where the 1911 is in this book. And that's a shame. 
what did they say? Did they say that the buffer slowed it down? I don't know. It's not a 1911 video. I got to remember that. I could do, I could do an all-encompassing one. It just throws all these long recoil guns together, but they're wrong here. Uh, yeah, basically the same information here, just kind of written in a different way. Not much. Not much in the Winchester book. Not much anywhere. But um, I'll tell you a little story. I've always had this. I've shown it to you before. The History of Winchester Firearms, 1980. 19, 1866 to 1975 by Watrous. Alright? Awesome book. We've been through this. Uh, I like this book because it's... Uh, what's the word? It does it... Uh, uh, the word is escaping me. It goes in order of when they were released. Chronologically. Okay? So the model's 61. They don't, they don't just have break it down by like... 22s, autoloaders, shotguns, whatever. They just go, the Model 61 was released in this at this time. Then they came out with the 60A, then the 63, then the 64. Didn't matter what caliber they were in. The Model 42, which um, I got to get one of these, by the way. Um, a 42, that's going to be, it's going to be coming up. I'm telling you that I'm going to be featuring that. That pump action 410 only shotguns, whatever, that, amazing. Very old, though. These things were, uh, factory showed the first delivery of them was made in 33. So they're not from 42. The first delivery was in 33. They're very old. They didn't make them long. They're highly desirable. They're like a model 12, but a, um, uh, but, a but in 410 kind of, they're scaled down like that. Excellent. And I think they're in you know, Pedersen as well so that's what i like about this book is that it's chronological okay so i saw this at a gun show sitting there like that it looked like this right and i go like oh i, I have one of those and i love it i was like how much what do you want for this and the guy was like 10 bucks i was like i'm getting this for 10 bucks i thought it was the same book and i'm like if anything i'll give this to somebody what a gift for somebody for 10 bucks the greatest freaking winchester book ever i love this book i got it home History of Winchester Firearms for Barnes. I'm like, Barnes? This is what truce. What do you mean, Barnes? 1866 to 1980 now. So apparently they just kept releasing this book going further and further. And I mean, it is thicker. So I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. Because, I mean, if anything, I can gift the older one. And actually, or, you know, just to keep them both, actually. <clears throat> but... Let's see what they got here for the 40. Let's see if these guys tell the truth. Model 40, automatic, self-loading, shot a gun. Just going to get my reading glasses, and they're on already. You know what that means? I'm going blind. Uh, the second Winchester shotgun of the self-loading long recoil type was first announced in the January, January 2nd, 1940 price lists. Factory record show the first delivery was made in January of 1940. All good hopes for this thing. Um, so what we're, what I'm trying to do is find out what the problem is here. I mean, I think the problem was that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in 41. I, from what I'm finding out, that's the that's the biggest problem I could find out. The patents expired. They copied the damn A5, and they were like, all right, whatever. We're, we're finally, I know from 1900 until 1940, we ate it. We ate the big banana, and we did not have a semi-automatic shotgun worth anything. Which, I'm sorry, 1911 fans, I do love the thing. But, uh, you know, I could kind of imagine. If I bought a brand new shotgun, I went shop shooting twice, and the stock was cracking. I wouldn't be that in love with it like I am now. I'm in love with it now because they're coming to me that way, and I'm, I'm a big, I root for the underdog. But if I would have bought a brand new shotgun back then and they would have been cracking like that, I would have been like, yo, yo, Winchester, what is the story here? I mean, I would have been like that. So, eh, I kind of get it. I mean, my love comes from 2021, not from, not from having a shotgun falling apart in, uh, you know, in, 19, in 1912. Well, anyway, 
Um, here's what we got. Yeah, 12 gauge only. 30 inch full choke, 30 inch modified, full modified. Basically the same info here. Safety magazine stocks. I'm not talking about uh, operation here. It was discontinued in 1941, about 12,000 made. See, I, I don't know. I trust, uh, I think I trust Mattis a little bit more on that, on the numbers. At the time of production, the M40 differed from most self-loading shotguns. It did not have the familiar hump or protrusion at the top or rear of the receiver. <laughs> yeah, they're just basically saying it wasn't like the A5 that they made millions of. It's like, it's not like all shotguns had a familiar hump. <laughs> It was like the only auto loader worth anything was the A5, and it had a hump. That's all. It is. That's all it is. But uh, was one of the so-called gooseneck shape, carefully curving gracefully down towards the tang, thus eliminating any optical interference when sighting the gun. I don't have any optical interference on my A5, guys. Uh, however, certain weaknesses developed, and its manufacturer was discontinued. They're always so vague. Certain weaknesses. Come on, I got a freaking gunsmithing shop here, basically. Talk to me. Tell me what the problem is with this gun. Nobody could, talk, could tell me. I want to know what to expect. Um, Mr. Brownell. Where are you, Mr. Brownell? Come talk to me. I know he's around here somewhere. Bob Brownell. What do you got for me? Come on. You got to have something. Nothing. This gun is not in here. Now this uh, this book. If you like this book, this is the uh, the Encyclopedia of Modern Firearms. You got to get one of these. Um, you could spend less than 100 and find one. Uh, and you could spend more than 100 and uh, find a really good one. The thing about them is, is that you have to look at these. This is what's important. It's uh, the first printing was in 59. So a lot of people will just go like, yeah, copyright 59. That's what they'll say. Because somewhere around here, like they'll just look, yeah, copyright 1959. They just go with that, like on eBay or whatever. But look at all these printings. This is the 16th printing in 1975. So this book will have guns up to 1975. Some of them, they go up into the 80s. So this right here is like, brrr, it's like that big. And it has like, a whole bunch of years. Now, I don't know if they started chopping out stuff that was earlier. Maybe if I got one of these from like 59 or 60, they're still this fat, right? The book is still this fat. So it has to have, maybe it has more older stuff. Maybe I will find, somebody tell me if you have one of these books and you have one that's older, 62, 60, whatever, 59, one of the first, or whatever printing you have, do you have the Winchester Model 40 in here, because I do not. What I do have in here is, this is what's cool. I want to show you the different setups for the different long recoil guns. So this is the the Remington, the Remington Model 11. The Remington Model 11, heavy loads, you have a taper facing backwards. I don't want to confuse anybody that's like, you know, messing with a, uh, an A5 or, you just gotta look, this is, there's just crazy combinations of these rings. Now, I don't know if there's a taper on the inside part of this for the ring. I would think that there is, because for the heavy loads, you would want to squeeze it from both ends, remember? And this says for heavy loads. Sportsman, position one. Position two was for light loads. And that puts that ring down here with the taper. I don't know if it's inside taper. There's an outside taper facing towards the spring, just like it was up here, towards the spring. And then they have another third position here for the cuts compensator. Which look the friction ring is taken out of the, the out of it completely. It's way back here, and then the other ring is up here with the taper facing forwards. Crazy! Who would think that that the um, that it'd be that much different? 
So if you have a Remington Model 11, do not follow what I was just showing you for the Browning because it is not the same. Now, here's the Savage. Let's uh, delve into the Savage a little bit. Enhance. Heavy loads. What do we got here? You know what? Let's just... I just want to turn it upside down so I can keep it, you know, keep it looking the same. So uh, the bevel edge goes inside for for uh, this is for light loads. Sorry, this is for light loads because it's upside down now. I'm gonna look here. This is for light loads. So the beveled edge, yes, facing towards the receiver, and the ring like this. Yes, this is the same. And the friction ring and the bevel edge. So this is the same. The Savage is the same as the A5. The same exact setup. And uh, let's see. Do we have the A5 setup? I could have sworn I had three bookmarks in here. Oh, there it is. Way up here. Where is it? I lost it. Back. Yes, here's the A5 now. So the A5... This is getting a little confusing now because like, once again it's upside down but yes yeah, so this shows it a little bit better it shows the taper in the barrel ring this is the barrel ring it shows the taper in the barrel ring up against the friction ring oh but look at that one side of the friction ring is tapered i forgot about that now, it's very important that that faces into, okay. So with the A5, let, and we have to take a look now at the um, back again. Okay, so what I'm talking about, let me, I'll get the book out of the way. What I'm talking about here is I forgot about this. There is a, a pointer. There is a taper in this friction ring right here on one side and then this side is just flat and the tapered side goes into the barrel always goes into the barrel uh, taper the ring on the barrel that's tapered whether it's for heavy loads or light loads so with heavy loads you have this ring here with the taper facing the flat side and with light loads you remove that and you put it here with the taper facing flat to the receiver to nullify it so it's just a flat washer okay so let's see if i i forgot about that let's see if my a5 is set up properly yes you see how it's tapered here on this edge and it's flat here that's important it's important that that always fits inside the barrels taper it always has to face that way easy to mess that up um, we gotta go back inside the 40 which uh, only makes sense after all I am doing a video on this gun let's go back inside again and uh, let's take a look again if there's a tapered side they would have copied browning exactly right you'd be stupid not to copy it exactly at this point if the stuff wore out the, the there isn't one there is no taper take a look it's just flat on both sides let's take a good look it's flat here flat there there is no difference there is no difference and look the spot where it rubs has a pattern on it you see that the spot where it rubs has like a pattern all right well i guess they uh it is important to line up these the gaps in these rings it is important that they line up. So yeah, 
it um, it does not. Will you just stay? No, you won't stay now, huh? Maybe that's a good thing. That's a good sign that it's not sticking like that. I would think. So a good way to do this is to just put it in there, slide the wood down. Oh, I'm way zoomed in here. You guys are like, what am I looking at? I'm getting dizzy. And then you just kind of hold it all together. You got to be like really strong. And just grip the whole thing like He-Man. Oh, and of course, because I'm holding something that really hurts, I'm going to have uh, problems threading it in. Once again, I'm going to stand it up. So I could just quickly put it together and not have any looseness when I'm showing it to you. All right. Yeah, let's uh, show you the loading gate. It's kind of interesting. Where's the other snap cap? Here we go. So yeah, so the loading gate is kind of weird. It has a um, it has like a tab here on the side. So if the bolt is open, that's the release right there. That's the bolt release. So if you go to put around it, it's going to slam home. And you, uh, you have, it, the lifter won't lift up until you press that. So you can kind of like just put the nose of the round right against it and push. The lifter will move and you'll have access. There's no step on here like there is on the 11. So you just got to kind of go all the way in. So again, when, when you have a round in there now, it's going to be holding that automatically. So you can just go up against the next one, push. And just go right into the tube. Loads pretty good. I don't think it's supposed to be there, though. That's where it's supposed to be. It loads pretty good, but it's it's awkward coming out of the tube. And I don't know exactly what's going on. But uh, should have just fell. Interesting that it didn't. Uh, try that again. These are chewed up too, so it's really hard to tell if that's what it is. It's not. Uh, it's not depressing the slide release here. Like the next one's not coming out. It could just be that it's just chewed up. That's what it could be. See, but it's it's there. It came out. Huh. It's wonky. I was hoping that, like, putting some rounds through it would, you know, kind of, like, free everything up. Because uh, I really delved in here and cleaned the crap out of it. Um, I got a lot of other videos. I might just be just random and randomly throwing those in there as I, um, <clears throat> as I do this video. But here I have this, like, cleaning video where I... I took it to the outside garage and like really blasted the crap out of it. Took all the wood off and just had the metal and just uh, gun scrubbed the crap out of it. I was not taking it apart, like the receiver apart fully. And um, thinking that that cleaned it enough to really get the gumminess out of it. Um, it seemed snappier. But um, then again, like I said, when I shot trap, it would not uh, kick out the round and stay open at least. Um, which if I needed to shoot trap with it, that's all I needed to do. But um, it was fairly accurate. I think I shot a 20 with it, but I was paying a lot of attention to the gun itself. You know what I mean? So, but it did fairly well. It handled well, pointed well. It felt good. Um, you gotta, you gotta be a little scared of these things because like, look at what I'm reading. And I'm like, oh, so, so, we, so just, um, we're closing in. I'm not going to go over an hour on this one. I promised myself, but some of the interesting things with the shotgun were that if you had a problem with it, so whatever these issues were, if you had a problem with this gun, and this is the truth, this is real, what I'm going to tell you. This isn't like made up. If you had a problem with it and you contacted Winchester, they'd be like, send it in. They had a policy. You pay for nothing. To, we're going to straighten it out. Whatever's wrong, don't even worry about whether it's covered, whether it's not, warranty, whatever. They basically were getting so many of them back they recalled it. I don't think there was ever like a recall by a manufacturer without it actually being a recall from, you know, like the actual people that would recall something. It was the manufacturer themselves recalled their own product and said, um, just forget about a Winchester self-loading 
shotgun, just forget it. We're going to send you a Model 12 and a nice one. Model 12 even costs more than the one that you bought. We're just going to send you one of those. Enjoy the greatest pump action shotgun on the planet. We're out. It was like a mic drop. Winchester took them and did a mic drop and just sent you a Model 12. You're like, hey, wait a minute. Where's my... So, I mean, a lot of people just held on to these because they liked it. But, like, forget about the low production numbers. Do you know how many of these they took back and destroyed? That's really what makes these rare. There's plenty of guns they made 20,000 of that they're out there. I mean, you see them, you know what I mean? This gun... Winchester themselves were just trying to make it vanish off the planet. There are stories that the ones that they took back, they lined up on railroad tracks. And when the, the trains were coming in to deliver to Winchester, they would drive over them and cut them up into pieces. Um, that kind of stuff, I don't know if I really believe because, you know, you could derail a train. <laughs> it's like somebody would get in a lot of trouble for that. So I don't even know if that I don't know if that's true, but um, it definitely is true that they were taking them back and not sending them back to the people. They were like, "Here, uh, have a Model 12 on us." And uh, I, you kind of wonder, what if you're like, "I got two Model 12s, man. I'm a Winchester fan. I have two of them. I don't need three of them. I want the, an auto loader. You know what I mean? Fix my gun and send it back. Or just, you know what? I just want my gun back to be like <laughs> Clark Griswold when. He goes, I want my car back, and it came back, and it was all crushed and stuff. So imagine you're like, I want my gun back. And they're like, all right, John, bring bring his gun back up here. Charlie, bring his gun back. And then it's like run over by a train. Well, I don't know. I like it. I, can't, I don't know what to say. I like it. It um, It is sleek and streamlined. I like the way like the bolt feels. I love the long recoil, even though like this one is like a real tough one. This one's really hard to cycle. Um, I just I like how it looks. I like the fact that it comes apart like an A5 because you know what I love the A5. So I want to know what Winchester's vision of the A5. They're like, yeah, well, if we made an A5, we would do it like this. The 1911 was not that. The 1911 was make an A5, but you can't use anything on the A5. You're making like a 5A, basically, or something like that. You're making your own interpretation, but you you can't copy it, you know? I would rather see what Winchester could do by copying it. I mean, you got to admit, in firearm land, there's all kind of copying going on. Aren't you interested to see what different companies, what different versions of a 1911 that they make? I mean, the 45, the handgun, the 1911, um, that there's so many different companies and they all have their own interpretations of how they do it and their own little things that they do. And some make them good, some make them not so good, some are cheap, some are, you know, like this. I, I love to see what 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 is your interpretation of coming out with the best um, 1911 45 handgun? You know, what's the same thing here. I love the A5 so much, I want to say, like, hey, Winchester, like, let's see you do it up, you know what I mean? And uh, and this is what they did, and uh, they just, they had such bad luck. They just really had bad luck. This one, the war, um, literally, like, right right on top of the release of this thing, and then producing, uh, them promoting it and everything was the World War II. And then, um, and then with the Model 50, so then the Model 50, they abandoned this altogether, and they had somebody come in and really, um, you know, like uh, Carbine Williams with his floating chamber. And it was originally like another Browning, Browning Sons design. And uh, the 50, the 50 was awesome. I got a video of that up there. That's the third semi-automatic they came out with. The 50 is an awesome gun. And then right behind it, there was nothing, nothing setting that thing back. They're like, we did it. They got, they're out there. They're not breaking. No design flaws. It's working good. And then what happens? Gas operation gets invented, and anything that wasn't gas operated was considered yesterday's news. And it's a shame, too, because I love the 50. Um, I thought I was going to... I got the 50 on a whim, thinking, like, oh, this would be kind of interesting. It's a weird, obscure Winchester shotgun. Um, and then I just worked my way backwards here, and I fell in love with all of these. This one, I'm going to go shoot trap with it again. I mean, I did post some video up here with me um, it was working fine. I just had to open the action each time, but it was, 
It was functioning. It didn't feel like it was falling apart. None worse for wear here. It didn't break, fall apart, crack, nothing. Um, and the, uh, the 1911, I just, I couldn't help it. I, I fell in love with that thing. I like all three of these. What can I say? So that's the, uh, that's the whole clan there. The 1911, the 40, and the 50. And um, this guy functions really good. Did I forget anything? I got the safety that you can turn off. I got the uh, how it loads. Low production numbers. So that's about it. All we got to do now is uh, go out and shoot it. Maybe I'll give you a follow-up report um on uh how it functioned with the uh rings changed around if you it's gonna be a few days till i get there so if this is posted and you are uh, you know, like an expert in one of these and you know that i'm gonna die by changing the rings around it's a browning's configuration for the a5 please let me know immediately because uh, you could be saving a life and until then we will be back soon i got plenty of cool stuff uh on the way got a lot of great ideas flowing and I appreciate all you guys tuning in. Uh, we've been doing good with the monetizations. It looked like they backed off a little bit on uh, like me showing you friction rings and stuff inside of a shotgun. That that doesn't mean I am giving you instructions on how to make one uh, yourself out of like uh, a, uh, you know, out of like a clock radio and a potato or something, you know, in your backyard. So um, they're backing off a little bit on the uh showing the you know, on disassembly and everything which is good um because when the videos are monetized um it, i don't really make it's not that i'm making money off of them it's like, that's not the issue the issue is that when they're monetized they're promoted by youtube youtube will send them to people that watch gun stuff and say hey maybe you'll like this check this out you watch shotgun videos check this shotgun video out and it helps to build the channel it helps to build the community in general but when they demonetize, then they don't they don't uh, show it to anybody. Somebody would have to literally come in and search for Winchester Model Forty uh, in order to see the video. You know what I mean? And and even then, you got to think that maybe they don't put it up there. You know? But um, but yeah, there's no there's no information on this shotgun. There's nothing out there. So I feel like I'm doing a public service. And uh, I will see you all next time. Be well. And. Uh, Happy shooting. Later. Wait, don't go just yet. There's more. This just came in the mail. I forgot I ordered this like two weeks ago. Um, I bought it on eBay. I like to troll the eBay, uh, the uh, make and offer things. Because uh, this book might have been like $49.99 and plus shipping. You can find up there. Some of them have cheaper than others, but there was one that just said make an offer. So I offered the guy ten bucks, and uh, and he took it. So ten bucks plus five dollars shipping for fifteen bucks. I got this book. So what did I end up with? I ended up with the greatest book on Winchester shotguns that there is. Is it used? Yeah, it's not beat up or anything. It's fine. The book is fine. So let's uh, let's get in here. Let's give this guy credit first of all, Dennis Adler. Nice job. So let's uh, zoom a little. And uh, let's play. I got to go to 180 something. For uh, Here it is. Semi-autos. What do we got? Here we go. Here's some nice 1911 photos. So uh, this book is awesome. So uh, let me get my... Uh, all right. They show the plane for $38. This is the 1911 Fancy, $56. Trap, $70. And the Pigeon Grade, $150. You could spend $38 or $150. No wonder you probably never see one of those Pigeon ones just for that reason. Um, this is a great view of what's going on inside the... 1911 with the buffer system might never have taken mine apart if I only saw this <laughs> as long as I looked in and saw these two washers and these two buffers I would have left it alone but you see no 
friction rings here. These things aren't frictiony. They don't rub on anything. There's nothing in there for them to rub on. They just cycle back and forth on the tube. Nothing spreads them apart. Nothing squeezes anything. They're just there to mitigate the recoil is, uh, is all. Supposedly, that's what they do. Some nice shots in this book, though. A lot of 1911 work here. So where's the... Uh... Oh, here it is. Here's the 40. After a 14-year absence, finally some information here on what the problem is. Read along with me. After a 14-year absence from the market on January 20th, 1940, Winchester introduced the new auto loader, the Model 40. A year later, it was discontinued. The design of the receiver had more graceful lines, but weaknesses quickly developed in the design. Usually there's a period there, but they go on, such as... Premature firing before the action was completely closed. I've heard. But there it is in black and white. Many were recalled. And owners who returned their guns were given new Model 12s. The example shown is a skeet gun with threaded on Lyman style A compensator with cuts compensator body. Um, yeah. Premature firing before the action was completely closed. And then they go right to the 50. <laughs> there isn't much. Where do they even have, where is the text even on the 40? Well, so that's what we're getting. Here's some nice shots of the 50. They say that they finally got it right is what they're saying. Lots of information on the 50. Doggy. And then on to the 1400. Into modern day. So, uh, nice book. This book is fat. I mean, look at this. This book has, uh, book has a ton of shotgun info. Oh, yeah. This is for the shotgun guy. Think about all of what's in here. The 1897. Uh, right? The, oh, this guy. The 1887. Model 12. All these single shots. Wow, this is going to be... It's going to be a lot of fun reading. Anyway. At least we got it in black and white. Fires before the action is completely closed. I don't know. I don't know if I want to mess with that. We'll see. Take care.